share our experience. Um, he provided effective leadership for the standard of care um, conference that we had a few years ago. And I'm so pleased to come back and work here with you. And I would like to thank Stephanie, so Mrs. Miller, um, for inviting me too. And I was just struck by the name of the foundation, Hope and Light. Um, it's really the hope that we have that these families gave us and gave me that we can see that we have rewritten the natural history as you have heard from Mary in her series her survival was 80% for SMA1 and we have taught our students and residents that 80% died 80% of spinal muscular atrophy type of patients died by the first year 90% by the second year we're totally wrong and that's that's the hope that we have to share with others. And I guess I didn't know Elena's name then light. And it's really the light that these families give us to walk this journey and to change the outcome. So thank you for that hope and that light. And um, I would like to thank our families in Cincinnati um, who have really been an inspiration for us, for me to, to be their pediatrician. <laughs> after the diagnosis um, as my role has changed and, and it's the families that have taught us how to, to tweak their, their diet because there's no evidence out there, there's no uh, way that we can look into data and literature, but over the last 10 years we have walked together with the families and it is a tribute to them, together with my dietitian Kirana, who has provided expertise from the nutritional standpoint for us to really see change outcomes. So um, without further ado, let me proceed with this point five minutes. I, I hope to be on time. Um, so this is an overview and I hope that by the end of this talk, we will understand what the common nutritional problems are in the patients with spinal muscular atrophy. I had a question yesterday, so what has GI issues, what has nutrition issues got to do with SMA patients? I hope by the time we get out of here, we have a clear idea what those issues are and how we can address them on a day-to-day -day basis, both from the family standpoint and from care provider standpoint. The second objective is really to share with you the recommendations from the standard of care conference that we had three years ago. Now, bear in mind that this was a consensus statement and it really reflects consensus. Therefore, we cannot publish like, like a recommendation based on a specific group or what somebody else does, but it's really consensus uh, that we reach. Um, but we will then kind of qualify with what other centers do, with what some other centers do, for you to have an idea of divergent strategies. And lastly, I think um, today actually is the 10th anniversary of me joining Cincinnati Children's. No, yesterday, 1st of May. And really, it's over the last 10 years that we have worked with our patients at our comprehensive neuromuscular center, which has an, a, an interdisciplinary approach towards addressing the holistic problems. Like what Mary said, she's a pulmonologist, but she does care about the GI issues because it's, it, it impacts the whole patient. We don't treat the disease, we don't treat our patients from the standpoint as a subspecialty, but we look at a patient as a whole patient, and therefore the team members come together, including the care providers, the family, the parents. And so basically the approach would be family-centered care. As what Mary had said, we would give families options. If the option is for palliative care and not to be aggressive, there's nothing wrong about that, and we'll respect that option. But if there's a family who would like to be very aggressive for the child to survive, the SME1 patient to survive and to thrive, we have that option and we have that support. So really, our goals for new optimal nutritional management will be optimal growth. We know that is the cornerstone for health, for general pediatric kids, as well as for this population that is even more crucial. And that would mean delivery of sufficient macronutrients, as well as the micronutrients, we've heard some talk about metabolic disturbances and why that's important as well. And we know that with muscle atrophy, that impacts bone health. And when you do your DEXA studies on these kids, 
the numbers were terrible, like three standard deviations below the mean. And, um, but then there are also limitations in the DEXA because it looks at the aerial density. And so the thing is to follow the trend and the progression of these kids for density and to tweak simple things like your calcium intake, your vitamin D intake, which we don't realize that actually 40% of us in this room are vitamin D deficient. So I think that is little things that go a long way. And last but not least, we have touched a little bit on metabolic function. Now, if you look back as clinicians for most of us, we do see some SNA1 patients seem perfectly fine till four months, six months, when they encounter an intercurrent viral illness. And then they present with a respiratory infection, and lo and behold, they lose their motor function. What does it remind us of? A mitochondrial patient. That's what our mitochondrial patients present. They're fine, they have impaired reserves, they have impaired reserves enough to meet their needs, but when they have an intercurrent infection, their impaired reserve leads them to a brownout. And that's the brownout that we see in our SME patients. And therefore, it's crucial to think about the metabolic disturbances, and you can address and optimize the outcome for mitochondrial patients with diet and supplements. And so why not in SMA1 patients? So that is the rationale. And there is literature down that if you look into it, actually there are more references than this for abnormal fatty acid metabolism as well as for secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. So at our center for SMA1 patients at the time of diagnosis, even before we start a new diet, I do a metabolic workup. You look at the lactate, you look at the pyruvate, you look at the organic acids, I can tell you 80% of the labs are abnormal, usually in the urine organic acids. And some of them were the more severe ones over the years do have mildly elevated lactate. And, and that is the basis for thinking metabolic in these kids and why they crash. This cartoon really summarizes the close interrelatedness between nutrition and neuromuscular disorders in SMA or Duchenne's, but more so in SMA 1s and 2s. If you're malnourished, what happens? You get reduced muscle mass, and there's impaired function, and it leads to progressive muscle weakness and progressive muscle atrophy. And the weaker the child is, the less the oral intake, and then you need to fail to try. So it is a vicious cycle which you must nip in the bud right at the beginning, which to me is like a stitch in time seems to mm. And therefore, the relationship between SMA and nutrition really boils down to four big areas. We talk about growth, but it could be suboptimal growth that is under nutrition, failure to thrive in a severe SMA once and two, or we have actually a big problem of obesity and overweight problems in our milder SMA 2s and 3s. And the bigger you get for that stage, they actually get more subcutaneous fat tissue. And the heavier they get, you lose more function because you have just that, that standard strength, but you don't have that strength to, to move an arm that's heavier than before. So we have seen loss of function just related to obesity. And therefore, it behoves us as, as primary providers in the muscle clinic to really think about why is that kid overweight too? We actually have diagnosed insulin resistance in the SMA too. She came being too big, and guess what? They thought she was having an edema. She came from an out-of-state um, facility, and she had been admitted or woke up with edema. She had all her liver function worked up. She had everything worked up. And so they came to our clinic, and they still presented the problem of she is swollen. But look, we did an MRI and get you that much of subcute fat in that little of muscle. <laughs> and, and so it's like, look, the MRI showed all fat. It wasn't T2 signals of, of, of edema. We did an OGTT. Guess what? The insulin level was like 200. It should be less than 50. 